Well, hi, everyone. My name is David. I'm one of the pastors here at New Life Prez, and I have the joy, honor, and privilege of preaching God's Word here today. Now, after a month-long break due to Missions Month, we are resuming our study through the book of Ephesians, which we've entitled The Church, Grace Made Visible. And to refresh us on what we've covered so far in the first half of Ephesians in chapters 1, 2, and 3, we saw and unpacked what does it mean to be united to Christ by faith? What does it mean that we have union with Christ by the gospel? And it means that namely that we are richly loved and blessed with every spiritual blessing. We're redeemed and forgiven, reconciled to God and to one another, and we have been given transformed new life in Christ. Or to put it another way, chapters 1 to 3 were all about what does it mean for you and me to be the recipients of God's grace in the gospel? What happens to us? How are we changed? Then in chapters 4 through 6, we began to see and unpack how our being united to Christ leads to living transformed, radically different lives. Or to put it differently, chapters 4, 5, and 6 are all about how should you and I, as recipients of God's grace, now live our lives. And in our particular text for today, Paul brings to our attention that if the gospel has really impacted and transformed us, then we, together as the church, we must endeavor to walk in the light. So we'll be unpacking what that means. And so I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 3 to 14. And so if you're able at this time, I invite you to please stand with me for the reading of God's word as an act of worship and reverence. We'll be reading verses 3 to 14. This is God's perfect word. It says this. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper. And arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is God's word. Please be seated. Let's pray one, once more. Heavenly Father, we come to you. Your word is everlasting. Your word is what we need. And so, Lord, we ask for your help. By your spirit, give us faith and understanding as we hear your word. And by your spirit, apply it to our hearts. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the central exhortation and point of this entire section that we just read is found in the middle in verses 7 to 8, where the Apostle Paul, he urges the church to walk as children of light rather than in darkness. Now, anytime you see walk in Scripture, that's simply a metaphor for living, how to live life. And so what Paul is essentially getting at is that there are two ways to walk, two ways to live this life. Either we live in the light or we live in darkness. And for the Christian, the one who has been truly united to Christ by faith, for the Christian, the only way to not only live authentically, true to who you are in Christ, but to also flourish as you live this life is to walk in the light. Or to put it another way, if you have really been affected and transformed by the gospel and you want to thrive, grow, and mature in the Lord Jesus Christ, then this is the key, walk in the light. That's what you need. That's what I need. That's what the church needs, to walk in the light. And so perhaps the question that our text confronts us with this morning is this, church, are you walking in the light? That's what the Apostle Paul wants us. In fact, he needs us, all of us, from the youngest of us to the oldest of us, he needs us to all answer that question before we leave this room. Are you walking in the light? 
For if we desire to be a vibrant, thriving, gospel-centered church that exists to display the marvelous grace and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, then we all must endeavor to walk in the light. And so what does that look like? That's what I hope to unpack from our text. So three points to guide us. Firstly, we'll look at the command to walk in the light. What does it look like? What does it mean? Secondly, we'll take a look at what are the obstacles that the Apostle Paul tells us prevents us from walking in the light. And lastly, we'll look at the power that enables us despite having all of these obstacles. Or in short, we'll look at the command, then we'll look at the obstacles, and lastly, we'll look at the power. So let's start with the first point, the command to walk in the light. Well, like I said, the command comes in verse 8, and for Paul, walking as children of light, it entails two things, two things. You need both of them. One, it includes avoiding sin, and two, it includes pursuing holiness. Walking in the light entails both avoiding sin and pursuing holiness. Let's break those two down, starting with avoiding sin. Look with me again at verses 3 to 4, where it says this. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Now, Paul's point here is that the Christian must avoid sin at all costs because it is improper and unfitting for believers and followers of Jesus. Sin ought to make us uncomfortable because it doesn't belong in our lives. It's out of place. If I could illustrate it in this way, you know, in my attempt to be a relevant millennial, because it breaks my heart, I'm one of the old guys now, I made a concerted effort to learn Gen Z lingo, like Riz, Cap, Chugi, I still don't know what Chugi means, and he ate and left no crumbs. Half of the parents here have no idea what I'm talking about. So as much as me saying those things makes all the Gen Zers in this room cringe, trust me, it makes me cringe as well, I've been told by both parents and students alike that it's the absolute worst. It's the cringiest of all cringe, the superlative of cringe, when parents try to say those things. Now, why is that? Well, if you think about it, it's because it's out of place. It doesn't fit them. Now, I know it's a silly illustration, but my point is that in the same way that we feel uncomfortable when old people like me, a millennial, tries to act in a way that's unfitting for me, When it comes to sin, we ought to have an even more visceral experience of discomfort because sin is all the more unfitting in the life of the believer. It's out of place. In fact, according to the Apostle Paul, sin should make us so uncomfortable to the point that it leads us to make every effort to make sure, in the words of the Apostle Paul, that sin is not even named among us. Now, what does that mean? Well, New Testament scholar Clint Arnold helpfully defined it for us like this. Paul is saying that an outsider who observes the daily behavior of Christians should never have an opportunity to name one of these vices as characterizing the lifestyle of any member of the community. Or similarly, that an insider may never see any fellow believer committing one of these sinful practices. In other words, part and parcel of walking the light requires a commitment to avoiding sinful practices that have no life in the life of the believer. Now, truth be told, avoiding sin, that might be a bit of a misnomer because Paul, he's not just talking about passively avoiding and keeping yourself at an arm's distance away from sin. Perhaps a more accurate description of what Paul is getting at here is what the Puritans called The mortification of sin. Mortification of sin simply means the active killing of sin in our lives. Now, mortification is not a Puritan idea. It comes from texts like Colossians 3, 5, where Paul says, put to death, mortify. It's strong, emphatic language. Therefore, what is earthly or sinful in you? And so going back to our passage then, some of the sins that we are to not only avoid, but also kill and mortify are listed in verses 3 to 4, namely sexual immorality, all impurity, covetousness, and foolish talk. Now you see, Paul's goal, it wasn't to give us an exhaustive list of sins, but rather to point out a few specific sins with the expectation that you and I as the church would apply the same rigor of avoiding and mortifying 
not only the sins listed in our text, but also all of the other sins that you and I struggle with on a day-to-day basis. Now, having said this, living in the day and age that we are, I think more than ever, we need clarity on what constitutes each of the sins listed by the Apostle Paul. And so let's briefly go through them, starting with sexual immorality. Now, fair warning to the parents, I'll try to keep it PG in here, G if if possible. But the word translated as sexual immorality comes from the rather broad Greek word porneia, which we, you know, we derive the word pornography from, which is used in scripture to refer to any kind of sexual activity outside of marriage. I can't emphasize that enough. Any sexual activity outside of marriage is sexual immorality. It's sin. Because while sex is a good gift given to us by the Lord to be enjoyed in the confines of marriage between one man and one woman, it quickly becomes distorted and sinful in every other context outside of marriage. This includes premarital sex, extramarital sex, the use of pornography, pleasuring of self, and with the rise of accepting cohabitation before marriage, any sexual activity with a boyfriend or girlfriend, and even a fiancé, is, according to scripture, porneia, that we must avoid and mortify. Now, closely related to porneia is the second sin listed, all impurity. Now, the word for impurity is rather broad in scope, and it refers to thoughts or behaviors that make someone impure or unclean. Now, if you couple that with the qualifier, all, and what Paul, what Paul is getting at is that any impure thoughts or behaviors are sinful. This includes, among a host of other things, lusting and fantasizing about someone who is not your spouse. And while this is neither the place nor the sermon to fully flesh this out, I do need to say all impurity also includes church, same-sex desire and attraction. The church must be clear. We can't shy away from cultural issues like this. Homosexuality and every aspect of it is sin. Now, I'm more than happy to dialogue with anyone about this topic further because it has become one of the passions of mine. But here's what I want you to know today, especially if you're sitting here today, you know, statistically, it's possible. If you're sitting here today and you yourself struggle with same-sex attraction or you know someone around you that struggles with same-sex attraction, what I want you to know today is not so much the arguments but the hope that you have in the gospel. I want you to leave here knowing that there is hope for you in the gospel. There is hope for your friend, your family member, whoever it is. I want you to know that sin, no matter how overpowering it might feel, sin, church, never has the last word. What does is the abundant grace of God towards you in Christ Jesus. Sin, it never defines you and shapes your identity. Only Jesus does. I pray that you would always believe that and be eager and willing to share that good news with those around you. But moving on, the third sin listed is covetousness, which simply is defined as an ungodly desire to acquire more and more. And this is a sin that many of us are acquaintances with, where it rears its ugly head when we visit a CG member's house that is bigger than ours. We look around and we feel ungodly jealousy welling up inside. Or it's that feeling we get when we see a coworker get promoted over us and we find hatred starting to brew over our supervisors and them as well. Or it's when your your friend's child makes it to the sports team while yours doesn't. And you say, after all this time, how could they not make it? And instead of blaming those around you, you start blaming God and you start blaming others. Or it also rears its head when you're scrolling through social media and you see the extravagant lifestyles that you yourself wish you had. You see, covetousness is the sin that makes us feel like we are entitled to more than what the Lord has graciously provided and given to us already. And the last sin listed is foolish talk, which is defined as some kind of inhumane or degrading jesting, often at somebody else's expense. This includes then gossip, And the words that you and I so casually toss around with little regard to how it might affect those around us, all under the guise of, it's just a joke. Now, the assumption of Paul's list in verses 3 to 4 is that these are all really obvious sins. Yet, as you are probably aware of, what should be obvious sins 
are too often tolerated and even encouraged and celebrated, and this is the sad reality, not only by the unbelieving world, but even within the church. And so we must be clear and firm, beloved sisters and brothers, we must not let sin, like sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, and foolish talk, we must not let them be named among us. As a church, we must walk in the light, avoiding and mortifying sin. That's the first side of what it means to walk in the light. The other side includes pursuing holiness. Because you see, walking in the light is not merely the absence of sin, but is also the presence of holy living. Look with me at the end of verse 8 to verse 9, where Paul says this. He says, walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. In other words, to walk in the light is to live out what is good, right, and true as defined in God's word. And Paul gives us a specific example of what that looks like in verse 4, where he says, rather than using your words to destroy, tear down, bring others down, which is sinful, let there be thanksgiving and encouragement instead. And so you see, brothers and sisters, walking in the light, it entails both avoiding sin, mortifying sin, as well as pursuing holiness. And so perhaps the question to reflect on at this point is the same question I posed before. Church, are you walking in the light? Has it been a priority for you to walk in the light? If not, why is that? Well, the Apostle Paul, he gives us two possible reasons, which leads us to our second point, the obstacles that prevent us. And Paul lists out two. So let's start with the first obstacle. The first obstacle Paul shows us is that we, that prevents us from walking in the light is when you and I, we forget our inheritance. What do I mean by that? Well, look with me again at verse five. Paul says this, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, truth be told, at a glance, verse 5, it comes off as a warning that those who are sexually immoral, impure, or covetous will have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That's what it seems like. But I like to make the case both from a theological and contextual standpoint that verse 5 is not actually a warning to us, but it's a sincere reminder to reorient the church to remember grasp and know the great inheritance that we have in Christ because it is that inheritance that motivates and spurs us on to walk in the light. Let me explain what I mean by that. You know, firstly, from a theological standpoint, if you recall Ephesians chapter 1, Paul, he goes to great lengths to assure the church, to assure you and me the gospel reality that if you have been united to Christ by faith, then you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. In other words, if you trust in Christ by faith and have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, then you and I can be unwaveringly confident that no person, no thing, no sin can take your inheritance in Christ away from you. Paul wants you to be sure of that. He needs you to be sure of that. Secondly, from a contextual standpoint, verse five in our text, is addressed to the same people as Ephesians 1, the church, whom the Apostle Paul emphatically declares that they have been given an imperishable, undefiled, and unfading inheritance in Christ Jesus. And so all that being the case, I think it then would be best to take verse 5 to mean something like this. You know, it's as, it's as if the, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul is standing here and he's saying, New Life Prez. Those who choose to walk in darkness, that is, those who persist in sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, and all other sins without any care to walk in the light, New Life Prez, you need to know that they do so because they have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. But you do. So don't live like you don't live according to the inheritance that you have. Now, what is this inheritance? Well, it's everything that Paul talked about throughout the book of Ephesians that we looked at. The forgiveness of sins, adoption as sons and daughters of God, peace with God and peace with one another, blessed eternal life. Or to put it more simply and personally, New Life Prez, your inheritance in Christ Jesus is that you belong to him and he belongs to you. 
We are his, and he is ours. And if that is true, then sisters and brothers, we have every reason and motivation to endeavor to walk in the light. Now you see, it's logically consistent to say that we should obey God, all the commands that he gives us, because he is God and we are not. That's true. By definition, if God is truly God, then he has every right to dictate how his creation lives. We call this the creator-creation distinction. But what our inheritance tells us is that more than simply because of the fact that God is God and we are not, what ultimately motivates us to obey God in avoiding and mortifying sin and pursuing holiness is love. It's love for God. It's love that compels us to live and do what is pleasing to God. And this is not for the sake of earning or gaining God's love or favor or acceptance. Because remember, the gospel tells you that you are already perfectly loved and accepted in Christ. It's not for the sake of earning or gaining love, but rather because we love God. Because the Lord is our greatest treasure. Or you can think about it like this. You know, I'm both sorry and not sorry that all of my illustrations are parenting illustrations because that's my life right now. But for those who know me, know that I am absolutely not a morning person. It's to the point that in my entire life, work, in my entire time working here at New Life Prez, the only time where I felt discouraged and where my heart sank, it actually wasn't when Pastor Will left. It was when staff called an 8 a.m. meeting. Now, praise God that it's only happened once in my time here, but I'm that kind of guy. I can't do mornings. Yet for the past 18 months, I've woken up far earlier than I ever wanted to or I ever dreamed of. Why? It's for the sake of my baby daughter. Now, sure, on the one hand, I have to wake up. I'm obligated to wake up, especially if it's just me and her in the house. But my primary motivator to waking up that early is because I love her. And I'll do anything to see her flourish and to be happy. And so, yes, on the one hand, you and I, we should obey the Lord in all things because he is God. We're obligated to do that. But the primary motivator of the church to obey and walk in the light is love for God. That's what our inheritance tells us. And it's when we forget whose we are that we belong to God, when we forget that, that's when we begin to welcome and entertain sin in our lives. So that's the first obstacle. The second obstacle that prevents us from walking in the light is when we are deceived of the true horror and wickedness of sin. Look with me again at verse 6. Paul says this, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, Paul's warning here to the church is not to buy into those who try to deceive us into believing that living in sin is okay, that sin is not that bad. In fact, Paul reminds us that the inevitable outcome waiting for unrepentant sinners is the wrath of God, which is the final judicial righteous judgment of God. And so despite knowing all this, this is all VBS, this is all Christianity 101. So despite knowing all this, how does this deception about sin show up in the church? Well, there are, there are a few, but let me just list two for us to consider this morning. The first way that we are deceived about sin is when we underestimate the evil of sin. Although we know that sin is bad, our natural tendency is to compartmentalize what we think are the really bad sins from what we think are bad, but kind of okay, kind of morally gray and acceptable sins. And so we mistakenly tell ourselves that so long as we avoid the really bad sins, then we're actually okay. But take a listen to what the English Puritan John Owen wrote in his seminal work on the mortification of sin. He said this, sin always aims at the utmost Every time it rises up to tempt or entice, might it have its own course, it would go out to the utmost sin in that kind. Every unclean thought or glance would be adultery if it could. Every covetous desire would be oppression. Every thought of unbelief would be atheism. Might it grow to its head. In other words, church, sin begets more sin. And so we cannot afford to be relaxed about sin, no matter how insignificant we might perceive a sin to be. Now, the second way that we are deceived is when we overestimate the power of sin. 
This is especially true for those of us sitting here who have been struggling with the same sin habits and issues for as long as you can remember. More often than not, I would venture to say that you feel that sin always has the upper hand. And so if you're honest, you're worn out, you're tired, you're ready to give up. Sin just feels too powerful to the point where we begin to falsely believe that maybe, just maybe, there is a sin in my life that can't be dealt with the grace of the Lord. And so whether it be deception about sin or amnesia of our inheritance in Christ, There are real, powerful obstacles that prevent us from walking in the light. But dear New Life Prez, as powerful and daunting as those things might be, you and I in the gospel have an even greater power that enables us to overcome all of the obstacles to now walk in the light, which leads us to our last point, the power that enables us. Look with me again at verses 7 to 8. It says this, Therefore, do not become partners with them, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The power that enables the church like you and me to now walk in the light is the gospel of grace that declares to us that in Christ Jesus, we have been transformed from darkness to light. And the one who has taken us from darkness to light is always and continually at work in us, sanctifying and molding us to be more like Christ. You know, what's most striking about verse 8 is that Paul doesn't say that at one time we were in darkness. He says, you and I, we were darkness. In other words, Paul is making an identity claim. He's making the point that we lived in darkness, we lived in sin, because that's all we could do. That's who we were. But now in the gospel of Jesus, when we receive Jesus by faith and are united to him, Paul effectively declares to all of us that our identity is fundamentally changed. We are no longer darkness. We are now light. Now, the implications of that are legions. Let me just list a few for us here today. Firstly, this means that the gospel frees us from the stress, burden, and anxiety of trying to become light of trying to become good. You see, the gospel tells us that in Christ, we already are light. And so the command to walk in the light is not so much a burden for us to become good, but it's a summons to us to simply live authentically to who we are in Christ Jesus. Secondly, if you are sitting here today overwhelmed by the burden and weight of a particular sin in your life, the Lord emphatically declares to you that if you are in the Lord, If you have received Christ by faith and are united to him, he needs you to know that you are light. Your sins, church, does not disqualify you and plunge you back to darkness. In Christ, you are safe. In Christ, you are secure. Thirdly, as the great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, grace does not choose a man and leave him as he is. The Lord who has made us light does not just command us to walk in the light, then leave us powerless on our own. The Lord assures us in his word that by his spirit, he is continually at work in our hearts, sanctifying and transforming us. We know this, but that's not the end of the story. For the Lord also gives us practical means to walk in the light, with one of those means being the ability, according to our text, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the ability to discern and apply the gospel to every area of our life. Where do I see this? Well, look with me again at verses 9 to 10. It says, For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, in verse 10, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. You know, when it comes to the practical application of avoiding and mortifying sin or pursuing holiness, it's true, the Bible, it doesn't often give us specific ways on how we're supposed to live that out. Instead, according to the Apostle Paul here, it says the Bible tells us that we are empowered in the Lord to discern what to do, to wisely discern what to do. And so what does this discernment process look like? Well, church is rather simple. It's something that all of us knows, but it's something that we need to be reminded of. It looks like the gospel pattern that we have been learning and emphasizing throughout the book of Ephesians, namely, the gospel pattern that you and I need to preach to ourselves every single day, that indicative leads to imperative. It can never be the other way around. It's indicative 
leads to imperative. For instance, when it comes to mortifying sin, gospel discernment points us first to rest in the indicative truth that we are fully and perfectly forgiven and redeemed in Christ. That's the indicative, but that's not the end. For gospel discernment then also propels us to think through in light of this indicative reality, in light of Christ's redemptive work, what is the Lord now leading me to do? What is the imperative? Now, as someone who holds to confessional reform theology, when it comes to reformed spirituality, my one critique is that I fear that too many of us in the reformed tradition, too many of us make the mistake or we mistake grace as permission to remain just as we are. I wholeheartedly believe that sanctification and growth in the Christian life is decidedly the work of God. Yet, church, we cannot get around the fact that Scripture is replete with imperatives to follow, practical ways to live out who we are in Christ Jesus. Or to put it in the words of the late theologian J.I. Packer, he said this, The Christian's motto should not be let go and let God, but it should be trust God and get going. Trust God in the indicative leads to get going in the imperative. But should we find ourselves still walking in darkness because we feel that we are either unable or unwilling to discern what is good, right, and true, the Lord encourages us that he has given us another means, a different means to reorient ourselves to walk in the light. The Lord has given us, friends, the church. He has given us one another. Where do I see this? Look with me again at verses 11 to 14. He says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You know, given that both this entire section that we just read is written to believers, and the main imperative that we see here to expose is the same verb that the Apostle Paul uses in his other epistles and letters, all in the context of responding to sinning members within the church. All that in consideration, I think the work of darkness that Paul tells us to expose here and what we read are the sins of fellow believers and sisters in the Lord. And the express purpose of this exposing is not to shame it's not even to guilt trip. It can't be that. But the express purpose of this exposing is to call back brothers and sisters who are walking in darkness to now walk in light. In other words, church, this exposure is restorative in nature. And it is one of the vital roles of the church, the, one of the vital roles that God has given to you and to me to help one another to walk in the light. And so as we come to a close then, I want to submit just a few reflection questions for us to consider before we leave. And firstly, it's this. It goes back to the question that I said our text poses to us. Sisters and brothers, after having heard all this, I want to ask you, are you walking in the light? More specifically, are you avoiding and mortifying sin and pursuing holiness in your lives? Secondly, if not, in, what are, when, in whatever areas of your life that you find yourself walking in darkness, whether it be in sin or forgoing holiness, I want to ask you, how is the Lord leading you to discern and apply the gospel in your life? How is the Lord leading and discerning you? I want to let you know that you have the Holy Spirit. The pulpit is, yes, it's vital. It's an ordinary means of grace. But what do you do when you get out there? You're told, as we heard in throughout our liturgy today, that we have the great helper that leads us to discern and apply the gospel in our lives. And so I want to ask you, where is the Lord leading you today? And lastly, if you have no idea about that second question and you're kind of just blank, then I want to ask you, who in this community can you share with to help you to discern and to walk with you? I encourage you. In fact, I charge you in the Lord Jesus Christ, share with them. That is why we exist as the church. That is what the church is for. It's a new life. Let us be a church that displays the marvelous grace of Christ Jesus our Lord as we endeavor to walk in the light together. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray.